Well, I am just feeling especially blessed this morning. Uh, really looking forward to our new pastor being here, um, the way that God has led us, and so glad Doug mentioned him in prayer this morning in his church and for uh, their um, in need during his transition, just as we have been. And hasn't it been wonderful to see the way that God has held us together and even grown us during this time? Um, you know, it's it's tough when we lose our pastor, but God has been with us, and I've been so blessed with the, you know, you really have a great team here. Uh, Cheryl is is wonderful and just does some fantastic work. It's amazing, really, the work that she does with our children, and uh, her uh, her oversight and suggestions that she gives to to Dak with the student ministries. It's been amazing, and then. Uh, I've been with Doug a lot this week, and he just is a blessing to me. And the way that he he does his work of visiting and praying and being with those that are going through struggles, and uh, he does it completely sincerely and from the heart. And uh, he's been such a blessing to me as as well. And uh, and I'm just thankful. I guess I just want to say how blessed I am to be part of this uh, team and humbled to be able to try to speak the word of God to you today and if you'll pray for me I'm sure we'll we'll all get something good from it okay <laughs> so let's uh <clears throat> let's start with the scriptures this morning Hebrews chapter 13 verses 8 through 16 is where we're going to be looking at this morning um and uh Hebrews is really all about taking what God did in the Old Testament and then what God has done in the New Testament through Jesus Christ and showing you how they contrast and compare and how what God did in the Old Testament has been fulfilled and what Jesus has provided. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And I, I, I commend it to you that you would uh, read Hebrews and let, let God speak to you through it. It's very powerful. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 through 16. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's a good place to start, right? And in, <laughs> for that matter. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar, we have an altar, from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Pray with me. Lord God, we ask that in these moments here together that you would uh, bless us and help us to hear and to understand and to respond to your word. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. And may you say something to us today that will change us and shape us to be more like Jesus, the one that we follow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as God revealed himself to his people Israel, one of the main things, and perhaps the main thing that he showed them, is that he is a God who is holy. He is holy. Now, what does holy mean? Holy means unique. I mean completely unique. There is nothing holy, no one holy, but God and God himself. God alone. He is holy. He is holy. Nothing else can be holy. No one else can be holy except in relationship to God and his holiness. And God revealed this to Israel in many ways, in many ways. One of the ways that you'll remember is that Moses is on the backside of the desert in Midian. He's serving as a shepherd out there after being exiled from Egypt. And there he is. He's a shepherd. He's passed by this particular place, walked on this ground several times. 
uh, many, many times, passed through there with his flock. And here on this special day, there is a bush, and it's burning, and yet it is not consumed. And what a strange sight that is. And so Moses stops there, and out of this bush comes a voice that is, reveals himself as God. And he says, Moses, take off your sandals, because this is what? Holy ground. Holy ground. Now that ground had been there all those years that Moses had been serving out there in the desert. That ground had been there. He'd walked by that bush many, many times. But today, this ground, this dirt, becomes holy ground. Why? Because a holy God has chosen to appear there. A holy God has chosen to manifest His presence in that place. And so the ground, the very ground, becomes holy ground because a holy God has come to be there, to, to show His presence there. And so God is a holy God, and whatever is related to God in His presence becomes holy as well. That's why Israel, because they were chosen by a holy God, became known as a holy nation. Because the God who had chosen them was a holy God. There's nothing like him. He is set apart. And he is pure in his righteousness and his glory. He is a holy God and he chose them. And so now Israel becomes a holy nation chosen by a holy God. And every nation needs to have a particular city, a capital city, if you will. And so they had a city that became their capital city called Jerusalem. And because Jerusalem was a holy city, it was a, was a city that belonged to a holy nation, it became a holy city. Because the city and the, and the nation belonged to a holy God. Are you staying with me here? Only God is holy and everything that belongs to Him and everything that's related to Him becomes holy. Okay? In that city, like most cities of that day, there were gates. And to go to Jerusalem, you would walk through the gates into the city of Jerusalem, the holy city. And in that holy city, they had a place where they would worship God. It was called the temple. And because their God was holy and they worshiped God in that temple, it was called the holy temple. It actually sat on a holy hill called Mount Zion, okay? So it was this holy place on a holy hill where they had a temple where they worshiped a holy God. And it was holy because God was holy. Now, I know, you're staying with me, right? <laughs> the very way that this, that this temple was structured taught Israel about God's holiness, how he was set apart, separated, and different. In fact, this temple had gates around it, okay, here, and, it, and it, what it, it had several different courts separated by these walls and by these various gates. To get into the temple, you went in through the gate, okay, into what was called the court of the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles just means nations, because if Israel's a holy nation, then you have Israel and everybody else. And so nation, Gentiles just simply means everybody else, the nations. Now, it's a really fascinating thing, and we should remember this, that God always had a plan, always had a place and a plan for everybody else in, in his plan for Israel. That he said to Abraham when he called him, he said, you will, from your seed, all nations will be blessed. So this became the court of the Gentiles, the place where people who were not Israelites, were not Jews, could come into the gates, into the temple, and worship God there. Isn't that good? Now, what, what you can know about this, too, is that since this was called the court of the Gentiles, the court of the nations, remember when Jesus came in and uh, they, were the, they were selling, buying and selling in the temple, and he got quite upset about that, flipped over the tables and all? Do you remember what he said? He said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. That tells you something, doesn't it? Where were they selling at? In the court of the Gentiles, okay? 
in the court of the nations. So Jesus wasn't just upset that they were doing business on a Sabbath day. They weren't, he wasn't just upset that they were buying and selling in, uh, uh, things in the temple or doing business there. What he was really upset with is they were taking up space that God had set apart so that the nations could come near to him. All right? Now, <clears throat> understand then that this court of the Gentiles was for everybody who was not an Israelite could still come to be come to Jerusalem, the holy city, pass through the gates of Jerusalem, and come into the temple, into the court of the Gentiles. But they could go no further. That's as far as you could go if you were not an Israelite. If you were not a Jew, you could go no further than these gates here. Okay? Then, if you were an Israelite, if you were a Jew, if you were a, a, a descendant of Abraham, you could come into these gates. This is called the court of the Israelites. Inside of these gates, you could uh, proceed into there to worship God. All right? Ladies, don't get mad at me. But they had another court. This was called the court of the women. All right? If you were a, a, if you were a Jew, if you were an Israelite, and a woman, you could come into this court to worship God, but no further. Because only Israelite males could pass through these gates to get into the court of the males. You get this? Ladies' room, men's room. All right? So <laughs> you could only, ladies, Jewish ladies could only come in this court and we're stopped here at these gates, and only the Jewish males could come into this gate. Now, as they proceeded into this gate, they would bring the men, the fathers of the family, would bring the sacrifice, representing their family, and the priest would take it here, and would go here to where this altar was, and they would offer the sacrifices for the people, for the families. They would offer the sacrifices for the people. And this was called the court of the priests. So only the priests could serve in this court. All right? So you got uh, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the Israelites, the court of the women, court of the males, and then the court of the priests. Now, the sacrifices were really important because they would take the blood from the sacrifices, which were understood to be as a, uh, as a covering or an atonement for sin for the families and for the people of Israel. And they would take them and they would take that blood and the, the priests would go into here. Now, only certain priests could go into here. This was called the holy place. In fact, this whole structure here was called the holy place. It was about uh, 15 feet by 30 feet, about 15 feet high. It's divided into two-thirds. This is two-thirds, and then this third, all right? And they would take that blood and, uh, that was offered here on the altar, and they would go into here, and they would use it for uh, various uh, anointings and, and different things like that, because this is the holy place, all right? The holy place right here. There was a... Uh, there was a, the... Candle, uh, candles, light, light, uh, light, lampstands, there, lampstands and the bread in here. They would do all of that in there, and only the priest could do that. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is the Holy of Holies. So you see how we, we weeded this out, right? Court of the Gentiles, court of the Israelites, court of the women, court of the males, court of the priests. Now just a few priests get to go in here. Or they have certain assignments that they'd go in there. And here was the Holy of Holies. Why was it called that? Well, it was actually believed that this is where the Holy God, His presence, dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant, a gold box about this big, okay? It was on the very top of it. It had, a, um, it had two angels facing each other with their heads bowed with the, their wings forward. And it was believed that right in between those two angels, the presence of God dwelt right here. The holy God. That's why only one priest, the high priest, and only once a year could take some of that blood and pass into 
the holy of holies or the most, most holy place here where the Ark of the Covenant was because that's where God was. And he's a holy God. To make sure to separate this part, there wasn't, there's a gate in, there's a gate into here, a doorway, but here there was a veil. Huge thing. The room was basically a cube, 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. And this, this veil, this curtain, was 15 feet high and about four inches thick, a huge tapestry thing. And like I said, only the high priest could go through there once a year and always with blood for the sins of the people because he was entering into the very presence of God, the holy God. This is how Israel worshipped a holy God. Now with that being said, here's the question. Where should God reveal his son? Let's go to the New Testament now. God has, is sending, as was his plan, is sending his son, conceived of the Holy Spirit, to earth. He is sending them to Israel as the Messiah, the king. He is sending his son to show us what he is like. He's going to reveal himself as God. He's going to show us what God is like. The holy God is coming in flesh to reveal himself to us. Where should God reveal his son? Where should God be known? Where should Jesus be known as the son of God? Now, I always had this image. When I was growing up, 60s, 70s, like that, uh, there was a ritual. It was on television every night, about 1130 on the East Eastern time zone. It was there. If mom let me stay up late enough, I can remember it so well. It just went on and on every weeknight. It was there. I watched it so many times. Usually I'd fall asleep soon afterwards, but there it was. There would be this tremendous fanfare on the television. Drums, and there would be uh, horns playing, and, and, and then the voice of the announcer would, would come forth, and there'd be this huge curtain that covered the whole TV screen. And the voice of the announcer would say, And now, here's Johnny. Now, you kids don't know what we're talking about. This was, <laughs> this was uh, Johnny Carson. He was before Jay Leno, okay? All right? <laughs> and that curtain would open up, and out would step Johnny Carson. And he would do his show, you know? And I always just looked for that curtain to open up, and the announcer would announce him, and he would come in. Now, here's how my mind works, all right? I had to just have this picture. Okay, back to the temple. You got that picture of the temple, and you've got this huge curtain, this huge, this huge tapestry, 15 feet high, 15 feet wide, four inches thick, all right? And God's going to reveal his son to Israel, to the world. Wow. And that's where God dwells. It's back there, so can you not hear it? The drums start playing. The horns start blowing. The high priest steps forth and says, And now, here's Jesus. <laughs> and that veil would open up, and out would step Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy One, revealed to the world. Right? Why not? Why not? Well, what God does is something so much more amazing and wild than that. He does something very, very different. We look at the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We read these words, the beginning of the gospel. It says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, that sounds like a pretty generic introduction, right? Until you realize that these words, the Son of God, here, is not found anywhere else on the lips of anyone else throughout 15 chapters of the Gospel of Mark. Nowhere else does it say that. In fact, the only people that kind of have it, the only creatures that have any, any idea who Jesus is in the Gospel of Mark uh, up until that point 
is uh, the, the, the demons who say, we know who you are, the Holy One of God, right? They, they kind of have an idea, but nobody else does. Peter at one point says, you're the, you're the Messiah, but it's very obvious if you follow that passage that he doesn't really know what kind of Messiah this is, all right? There was all kinds of ideas who the Messiah would be, not necessarily connected with the Son of God. But nobody else gets it in the Gospel of Mark until, until the very end. At the very end of the Gospel of Mark, what we have in chapter 15, we have uh, Jesus going to his death at a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Now that doesn't sound like a very attractive place, does it? Dad, where are we going on vacation this week? We're going to Golgotha. Well, Dad, what's that mean? The place of the skull. Oh, goody, you know, right? Nobody wants to go to the place of the skull. And there's a reason for that, because Golgotha was not a nice place. Golgotha was not the place that you want to go. Golgotha, in fact, was outside of the city gate. In fact, let me show you. You've got this whole thing of these concentric circles of what the temple is shaped like. Outside of this, you've got the city gates, and then you've got the court of the Gentiles, the court of the priests, the court of Israel, the court of the women, and then the holy place and the holy of holies where God, the holy God, dwells. Do you know where Golgotha was? Golgotha is here, outside the city gates, outside of all the gates of the temple, way outside. In fact, this is, this is the place that is so far outside that this is the place where the priest, when they finished with the sacrifices and offered all the good parts to God, the parts that were good for food, all right, and the parts that were, that were especially offered and dedicated to God, they took the bodies, in other words, the leftovers, the visceral stuff, okay, and they took that outside the camp, outside of the city gates, and they dumped them out here in a place called Golgotha. What does that mean? Golgotha, then, it's kind of like the city dump. It's the place where you take stuff that the priest considered unclean. I mean, the guy that had the job to take the stuff out, you know, take out the trash, right? Take the stuff out to Golgotha was unclean. Couldn't go back in here for a while until he was cleaned up for a day or two, right? This was the unclean place, Golgotha. And yet, so naturally, if you're going to have a public crucifixion, let's don't do it out in here. Let's do it out here, right? Out here. And this is where Jesus was taken to be crucified. Now, an amazing thing happens in the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus is actually dies, at the very moment that it dies, Mark describes it this way. He says, he, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Now watch, watch. Like Mark is like producing a, a movie or something. He goes back and forth from these two different scenes. Here Jesus is at the cross, Golgotha, and he dies on the cross. Mark takes us then, let's meanwhile, back at the temple. He takes us back to the temple. And there at that very moment when Jesus, with a loud cry, breathes his last and dies, the curtain of, that, of the temple, that veil that goes into the most holy place, 15 feet high, 15 feet wide, 4 inches thick. That veil is torn in two at the moment that Jesus dies. That veil is torn open. And it's torn open from the top to the bottom to make it very clear that this is not something that any man did. This is what God has done. God has pulled back the curtain to the most holy place at the very moment when Jesus dies at, on Golgotha. Now, Mark says, okay, you've seen what happened, is happening in the temple? Whew, back to Golgotha. And here at Golgotha, at the foot of the cross, stands a centurion, a Roman centurion, 
one who was part of the invading nation who had taken over the world at that time, including the promised land of Israel. At the very foot of the cross, here is a Roman centurion, a Gentile, not an Israelite, who looks up at the cross on Golgotha's hill and says what nobody else has said in the whole Gospel of Mark. Surely this man is the Son of God. He gets it. He gets it. What's happening at this moment? God is introducing himself through his son Jesus Christ to the whole world. The veil of the temple has come open. And not, a, not the most high priest, not an Israelite, but a centurion, a Gentile man, looks up and says, this is the man, this is the son of the most holy God. This is the son of God at Golgotha. You see, that's why Hebrews tells us that the high priest carries the blood of animals to the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Do you get this picture? Jesus dies out here on Golgotha, the city dump, the unclean place. And the holy blood of the Son of God falls on unclean ground. What's that make this place? We sing about it, don't we? We sing songs about Calvary, right? We don't want to sing at the city dump. <laughs> we sing at Calvary. That's where the blood was, was shed. That blood that makes everything holy was shed there. Now, Let's unpack this now. What does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus is revealed, that the holiness of God, the blood of Jesus, falls on Golgotha? Not inside the temple, not inside the holy place, not inside any of those gates, but outside all of the gates on Golgotha. What does this mean? Well, first of all, it means that everyone can come to God everyone. Are you getting this? Everyone can come to God. Now, let me tell you, I told Doug in the first service, Doug, you ever preached anything in the past, and then you look at it later, and you go, you, know, you know what, I preached that wrong. Well, this is one of those things, because I preached for years that when that veil on the temple was torn in two, that it was torn in two so that we could all, not just the high priest, we could all go into the most holy place. Well, you know that's not true. The temple's not even there anymore. And the fact is, if it was, what would that mean? What kind of religion would we have? We'd have a religion where all of us, sometime during our lives, would take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and go to the temple and pass through all those gates and finally walk into the most holy place and see the Ark of the Covenant where God was. Right? But you know that's not true. That's not the point. The point was not that we could... Uh, to show that, that the veil in the temple opened so that we could all get into where God was. The point is that God's not in the box anymore. That God has come out. That God has come out. At the very moment when Jesus dies and his blood is shed, God comes out of the box and even a Gentile standing at the foot of the cross can recognize him now as the Son of God. That's powerful. What that means is that everyone can come to God because God has come to you. Wherever you're at, wherever you're at, he finds us. He comes to us. Like a shepherd who leaves the 99, he's coming to find us. And even Golgotha can't hide us. He'll find us because everyone can now come to God because God has come to us. The second thing this means is that everyone can be made holy. Everyone can be made holy. This is amazing because the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 10 verse 10 that by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Everyone, everyone now can become a child of God related to a holy God. And his holiness becomes 
our holiness. He shares his holiness with us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and sets us apart as his very own. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, not me, not me. In fact, it was pretty hard for me to come through that door this morning, let alone the gates, right? It was pretty hard for me to get here. I've always been one of those people that I thought if I came to church, the the roof might fall in or something. I, I am unacceptable towards God. Well, why do you say that? Well, you don't know the junk in my life. You don't know the garbage, the past, the shame, the guilt, the stuff. The, oh. Well, listen, here's the news. If the blood of Jesus can fall on the trash dump of the city, if the blood of Jesus can, can make a place like Calvary into a holy place, guess what? The blood of Jesus can make you a holy person too, no matter what kind of garbage you got in your life, no matter what anybody else has dumped on you. God has come to you. Jesus has come to you. And by the death of Jesus on Golgotha, those who confess their sins, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Through the blood of Jesus. Wow. Yes, praise the Lord. Nothing, nothing can keep you from God. Not, none of your uncleanness or none of our unholiness, none of that, because Jesus died on Calvary. He died on Golgotha. And uh, all of us can be made holy. That's good news, isn't it? And wherever you're at this morning, if you're carrying a burden of sin, guilt, and shame, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all that. All we must do is trust him, confess our sins, believe that when he died on Golgotha, he did it for you. And the blood of Jesus cleanses you and makes you acceptable to a holy God. And you can be his. You can be his child. He will adopt you as his own. Trust him this morning. If that's you, trust him this morning. Here's the next point. What does this mean? Now, this one, this one is for those of us who are followers of Jesus. Listen carefully to this. What this means is that everyone who follows Christ must go outside the gates as well. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13 says, Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. Now stay with me here. What this means is, listen, Jesus died outside the gates of the city. He died outside the gates of the holy city. He died outside the gates of the holy temple. He died outside the gates of the holy place. And he never went back in. And if we're honest, the truth is, people, that sometimes those of us who go by his name try to rebuild the holy place. We try to say, this is a holy place. That the presence of God lives in this place. That the presence of God's here and we come see him once a week. (laughs) Right? Can you imagine that? I mean, Jesus, after his resurrection, could have. Could have walked right in past the gates of Jerusalem. Could have walked right in to the city. Could have walked right in to the temple. Past all the gates. Right into the holy place. Stood at the holy place and said, I am the son of God. I am I am the one. I'm the Messiah. And I'll meet you here every Sabbath day. We'll sing together. We'll pray together. And I'll give you a message. And then I'll see you next Sabbath day. But he didn't do that. He died outside the gates of the city. And he's still out there. And the call for those who follow him is not to come and visit a holy place The call is to follow him outside of the gates. Now, don't get me wrong. The book of Hebrews itself says, let us not give up our habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. We're supposed to be here today. We're supposed to be encouraging. We're supposed to experience his presence and bless one another and all of that. But don't get mixed up. Following Jesus is, his means that he's still outside the gates and the call of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 13 is let us go to him you say well where is he if he's where is he 
He's still in the Golgothas of the city. He's still in the Golgothas of our world. Jesus said it this way. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and I was in prison, and you came to visit me. When, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? When did we see you sick or in prison? When did we see you naked and needing clothes? He says, as much as you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Where's Jesus? He's still out there. See, we can't make it about a place where holy people come to visit a holy God. And then we say, and then we put all these gates, all these rules that says you got to do this to get past this gate, to get past this gate, and then maybe you can come in here. Are you with me? This is what religion still does. It builds holy places. It puts God in a box and says you have to come through our gates to get into here and Jesus just turned that whole thing inside out to where even a Gentile at Golgotha can look at a cross and find the son of God are you with me okay so what does that mean it means we have to go to him we have to find him where he is among the widows and the orphans among the hungry and the thirsty and the the lonely, and he's still out there. He's still out there. The last thing this means is that every barrier, including the gates of hell, has to come down. <laughs> every barrier. Uh, you don't get that or you'd be really, really excited right now. <laughs> See, Jesus told Peter, he said, you are Simon, you are uh, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He told Peter that, okay? Now, here's the thing. Hell has its own gates, all right? And, and, they're, not, and, and they're out there, okay? And the truth is, is that Satan really doesn't care how much church, he's really not afraid of how much church we have in here. He's scared to death that the church is going to hear what Jesus said, take it for, for truth, and storm his gates, because the gates of hell cannot stand before the church that Jesus is building. <laughs> Are you with me there? He's going, to every, every barrier has to come down, including the gates of hell. And listen, this is such good news that neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female can be kept out. Everyone who comes to faith in Christ will know him and will experience him and be part of a world-shaking body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ that will go forth to shake this world, to shake the light out of, bring the light into the darkness. That's for you and that's for me. That's for all of us. That's for all of us. He's outside the gates. That's why Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, deny yourself, take up my cross, and come on. Come on. This morning, no matter where you're at, if you're one of the ones that say, you know, I've never really trusted Jesus to take away my sin. I'm not sure I'm acceptable to God. Well, the good news today is is that by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're acceptable to a holy God. And that blood has the power to set you free and to cleanse you from all sin and to make you righteous in his sight. That's a glorious, glorious thing. All the gates are torn down. Come on in. (laughs) Come on in. And then for us, we have to go follow him this morning. We have to go follow him this morning. Would you stand with me?